Sure. That seems fine. This is showing. That's fine. Not logged in for some reason, but whatever. All right. Content update 3.22, Path of Exile, Trial of the Ancestors, a.k.a. Auto Battle League. The Ancestor Challenge League. Challenge Leagues are a great opportunity for a fresh start in a new economy. All of your old characters and items are still present in the standard and hardcore leagues, but you're encouraged to join the new leagues, complete challenges, and demonstrate your mastery of Path of Exile. In the Ancestor Challenge League, you'll visit the Karui Afterlife and defeat 10 tribes in a series of tournaments to earn valuable new rewards. As you play through the league, you'll find tradable silver coins which can be used to gain passage to the Karui Afterlife. You'll start out with a basic team of three Karui Warriors to enter the Trial of the Ancestor. In each match, you can select which tribe to compete against based on the reward offered. You can examine the battlefield configuration of the enemy team and strategically place your warriors to challenge theirs. Then you and your party will compete alongside your warriors to destroy the opposing team's totems and win the match. When you compete in tournaments, you accumulate favor with each of the tribes. This can be spent on recruiting warriors and purchasing field items and equipment to power up your team. Each tribe has their own specialties and you can mix and match warriors from different tribes to build a team that embodies your strategy. For more information about this expansion, check out pathofexile.com slash ancestor. With 3.22, there are standard, hardcore, solo self-found, and ruthless variants of the Ancestor Challenge League available. They have the same core mechanics and items. You can create private league versions of these leagues with mods that make the game harder. The new Ancestor Challenge League includes a set of 40 new challenges and 8 new challenges in Ruthless Ancestor. There are microtransaction available rewards for completing the challenges that are only attainable in this league. These rewards will be revealed in the upcoming news post. New content and features. How long is this stuff? Just like, just real quick. Brrr. You said it won't take long, you lied. Added the Forbidden Sanctum to the core game with a few adjustments. Please read the Forbidden Sanctum changes section for more information. Added a new strength support gem, Controlled Blaze. Supports melee attack skills, providing them with a chance to ignite. Supported skills deal more ignite damage for each ignite inflicted with them, but less damage. Added a new strength support gem, Corrupting Cry. Supports Warcry skills, making them inflict corrupted blood on enemies affected by the Warcry or by attacks that it exerts. Added a new strength support gem, Trauma. Supports strike skills that you use yourself, causing you to gain trauma the first time you use a supported attack hits an enemy. Supported attacks deal added physical damage per trauma, but also makes you take physical damage per trauma. Supported skills can only be used with axes, maces, scepters, and staves. This is like Bone Shatter light for everyone, which is pretty good. And yeah, it, similar to Bone Shatter, it makes it so that if you use like multi-strike, you don't quickly build up. Added a new strength support gem, Volatility. Supports attack skills, causing them to deal more maximum attack damage, but less minimum attack damage. Supported skills also increase damage. So it gives you a wider range, and then you can use it with like Rithlasas to have even bigger range. And then you do lucky damage to make it so that you have crazy high damage. Half of the page is ruthless changes. <laughs> Added a new strength intelligence support gem, Flamewood. Supported skills, support skills which summon totems, triggering avenging flame when a totem went from support skills is hit by an enemy. Avenging flame fires a mortar up into the air, which falls down upon a target and deals area damage when it lands. Yeah, they showcase that. It kind of works okay. There's like a few ways to give your totems taunt. There's the mastery. There's ascendancies. There's decoy totem, or just general totems that hit a lot. That could be good. Added a new strength intelligence support gem, Guardian's Blessing. They like just teased this today, right? Must support both a skill that creates minions which can be damaged and an aura skill that creates permanent auras around you. Supported aura skills have no reservation and count as a blessing skill. They cannot apply auras on you unless you have minions from a supported skill, but these minions take a percentage of their maximum life as physical damage per second while you have an aura from supported skill. So that's kind of hard to mitigate. There is physical damage reduction on the tree four minions. It's like between shadow and witch. There's a good amount of it. That's kind of a hard... Physical damage over time tends to be something that's hard to mitigate. Added a new dexterity support gem. 
Returning projectiles. Supports projectile skills. Projectiles from support skills return to you. Cool. This is uh, Vengeance Cascade Light, right? It's supposed to be the idea. Added a new dexterity strength support gem, Sadism. Supports any skill that hits an enemy, causing damaging ailments inflicted by them to deal damage faster, but causes the inflicted ailments to have less duration. This is just Swift Affliction 2.0, right? Yeah, that seems okay. Typically, it's not something you really want to use, but maybe you can make it work. You always have, you know, the the Curse Ignite shenanigans. Poisons tend to not like these things because Poisons gets a stack. Regular Ignite builds seem okay with it. Bleed can be okay with it. Like, Bleed has limits. Even Crimson tends to have limits. So maybe it's alright. I mean, it's just another support gem for them to have damage. How bad can it be, right? Added a new Dexterity Intelligence support gem, Locust Mine. Supports attack skills that use bows or wands and fires projectiles ahead. Instead of using that skill, you will throw mines in an arc that use the skill for you, targeting your location when you detonate them. Yeah, they showcased that fairly early on. I'm not convinced by that being better than just what people have done before with, like, kinetic blast mines. Added a new intelligence support gem, Frigid Bond. Who cares? No, I'm kidding. Supports link skills. Supported skills... Damage and chill enemies between you and Link targets. I really wish they would give better support to player to minion Lincoln. It would make me more excited about Link skills, but my small time that I played with Link skills, which was like for a bounty in one of the gauntlets, I don't like them. I don't like them one bit, when it comes to minions at least. I think with players they're fine. People tend to like them well enough there. But as far as minion linking, never been the biggest fan. Added a new intelligence support gem, Fresh Meat. Supported skills that create minions. Minions created by support skills gain Wakened Fury and Adrenaline for 10% of their duration up to a maximum of 10 seconds. Yeah, so this they I think they showcased that with zombies. Kind of a, uh, if you're constantly resurrecting, raising? Raising zombies, or like skeletons maybe, SRS, any of this other stuff. You know, it makes them very powerful. Should be okay. Added a new intelligence support gem, Sacrifice. Supports spell skills that deal damage with hits and have no reservation. These spells sacrifice a percentage of your current life to gain additional chaos damage based on how much life was sacrificed. Cannot support orb, brand, channeling, vol, or skills used by trapper mines. Cannot modify the skills of minions. Sure. I mean, we'll have to see the number on this. We have to see a number of a lot of these. Like, it's cool seeing the patch notes, but really, the the big release is really the gem information. That's that's when we can really start doing the cooking. But it sounds okay. I mean, another source of flat chaos damage could be helpful to quite a few skills. Then, like, having the life loss isn't going to be the biggest deal, especially while you're mapping. You have plenty of ways to, like, recover the life. Added a new intelligence strength support gem, Spellblade. Support spells that hit enemies, causing them to have added spell damage equal to the percentage of damage of equipped one-handed melee weapons. You can't use this with two-handers? If two weapons are equipped, each contributes 60% as much added damage. Can you not use this with two-handers, but you can use it with dual wield for like 120%? Wait, what? This is so strange to me. Why would it be set up that way? Maybe... No, that doesn't make sense. So you can't use bows, because bows are two-handed weapons. You can't use any two-hander. You can't use a staff. You can't use, like, Marori. But you can use two one-handers. And they both contribute. The two one-handers is interesting to me. Because that's not how Battle Mage works. Battle Mage would only use your primary weapon. That is to say, if you use the two-hander, you get the two-hander. If you use the one-hander and one-hander, you get the primary one-hander. Whereas this one lets you do wield things like the, um... Oh, what is it? There's like a one-handed axe that has a bunch of flat, cold, and fire. You could do wield those. You could do wield Noctoles. Which would have... I mean, they have like a decent amount of flat, but then you also get Battle Mage from the main-hand one. 
So you get what? 100, you get like 220% of Noctil's Lantern as flat damage effectively doing that. That's pretty good if you're dual wielding them. It's hmm. very interesting. Added a new intelligence dexterity support gem, Devour. Supports any skill that hits enemies, killing blows from support skills, consume corpses to recover life and mana. So this thing isn't good. The only the only thing I could see this being good for is if for some reason you really need corpse removal and you cannot fit it any other way. The recovery is almost certainly going to be irrelevant, especially at the cost of a support gem. But the ability to just slap on... Like, let's say you do have just overkill damage for mapping. Like, you could just have this for a little bit more life recovery, which you're probably already going to be capped out on, especially considering how easy it is to get life gain on kill. But then just, like, corpse removal, right? Just generic corpse removal is pretty good. I don't think it'll be used, but if it does get used, it'll be for that reason. 15 new unique items, including one designed by the winner of the Crucible boss kill event. Added two new divination cards designed by our supporters. Only two. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive skill, Extreme Archaeology, which grants 200% increased explosive radius in your maps, 100% increased explosive placement range in your maps, Expedition Monsters in your maps spawn with an additional 10% life missing, and number of explosives is 1. That's kind of neat. If, you're, if your build doesn't care about immunities, whether you're like a multi Ellie build, such as like a Trinity build, if you're... I don't know. It's pretty much that. Like, what else is a multi, multi damage type build? Maybe fizz, poison builds. I don't remember if poison, if fizz builds can poison through fizz immunity. I think they can now. I think they couldn't originally, and they can now. Maybe those builds. It'd be kind of nice, right? You don't have to think about. It. You just drop the explosive. It's not gonna be very efficient, but it'll be very fast. To make expedition brainless which is kind of nice i did a new atlas although there are some maps where that's not going to be good like so and if you take like city square it'd be fine right like big nice open map the explosive is going to cover a good percentage of the expedition but if you have something like toxic sewers waste pool overgrown crypt any of these like segmented room and then a tunnel room then a tunnel map it's going to be terrible it be absolutely terrible. You're going to catch like 20% of the map, if that. Those are ones where you really need placement range and multiple explosives. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive, Lucid Dreams, which grants vol side areas in your maps are no longer corrupted. I did kind of like the idea of this. But we need to see what the new vol side area modifiers are. So the old vol side areas used to give you like divination cards or corrupted items or double corrupted items. And they were quite fun whenever you can see that. Because you could read the side areas, you would see that there are double corrupted items behind it, and then you would go in. At least this is for me. Like, this was my own personal experience, right? And then you would also have things like, you'd see Vol Orbs early on, and you're like, well, I could really use three Vol Orbs. I need it for Atlas completion. But we'll kind of have to see what the new modifiers are, since they've completely reworked it, as far as I'm aware. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive, Destructive Play, which grants the Maven summons one to three additional bosses when witnessing map modifiers. Modifiers to the final map boss in each map also apply to these summoned bosses. This is incredible. This is so ridiculously good, in my opinion, early on for map sustain. The problem with this is that's looking at it in a vacuum and this still has the problem and i did a lot of maven witnessing last league as opposed to alters the problem with this is that you don't get to do alters while you're doing this so even though you get a bunch more bosses you get a bunch more loot and bosses do drop a good amount of loot bosses drop a good amount of maps you get to do your maven witnessing very quickly you get to do you know your 10 ways spam them over and over you get a bunch of guardian drops there's no way the extra bosses have normal item drops, right? Why not? If it's anything like Guardian's Aid used to be, they do. And I, I think this is going to play like Guardian's Aid. But for regular map bosses. And then also regular map bosses while you're doing Guardians, which is kind of cool. But it'll just give you a bunch of 10 ways. And also, if you're like, if you're a Guardian farmer... If you farm Guardians, Elder Guardians, Shaper Guardians, Conquerors, whatever have you, 
you can have this on and you'll you'll just get a huge amount of ten ways for free. Right? I think that's going to be awesome. Personally. Also, modifiers to the final map boss in each map also apply to the summon bosses. That's going to apply to things like sextants, right? There's like a few cheeky things you can do with it. Nothing like phenomenal, nothing that gives you like a crazy amount of money, but you can get eek a little bit of extra value here and there from it. I think it's very strong. For sure. I think it is exceptionally strong, and I'm looking forward to playing with it. Even if you're not going to be sacrificing altars for it, just when you're doing your guardians, I think it's going to give you a significant amount of value. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive, All Hands, which grants your maps 40% chance to contain a random master encounter, plus 40% chance. That's pretty good. Modifiers to chance to grant an additional master mission on a map completion. Instead, apply a chance for that master to be randomly encountered in your map at 150% of their value, and your maps do not grant master missions when completed. Okay. How does this work, though, for some of the masters? My fire has a chance to grant an additional master mission instead of probably a chance to be around kind of 100% of their value. Sure. So you can have like a 100% chance to find your master, but you have to be running maps and then find the master inside it. I'll just have to see how this plays. But it sounds cool. Because you... Yeah, you should be able to have a 100% chance to find your master. So one of the problems with this, though, is that your maps don't grab master missions when completed. You can get quite a bit of master mission completion, and you can also gain multiple master missions per map. But if you really enjoy one of the master missions, then it's OK. Should you? Should you what? I think these are about to play. Oh, as are in progress. Here, I'll take a I'll take a short break. I'm gonna get up, get water. We'll come back. I'll read the rest of the, the patch notes and all that, so people don't have to see the ads. I think it's only a 58% extra chance for a singular master. You have you have base mission chance outside of that, and you have mission chance on the passives. I don't mean with this keystone alone. I mean with other stuff. Either way, I'll be right back. And you need to what, like just under 70%, right? You get 40 from this. Ruthless is also going to really like this. As much as I don't like Ruthless, Ruthless is going to love this. I think mission chance is 12% if you're wandering path. No, it's going to be much higher than that. Like, extremely higher than that. Should it not? Maybe it won't be. I guess I'm thinking of so whether if you have multiple assigned at once, whether it stacks up and then divides or not. Maybe it doesn't. Okay, so you're saying that it's effectively going to be like, you have like roughly a 50% chance to see a master mission, and then you have a 20% increased chance, like a 1.2 modifier-ish, a little less than that, for it to be the master of your choice if you've fully allocated that master's appearance chance. But I don't think that's right.
Because there's some base value to them already, right? But maybe you're right. Maybe it's not as high as I think it is. Maybe I was confusing the two different terms. The chance for a master to appear and then the chance for your master to be like whatever it is. Then like 2% per master? What, just like on a naked map? No modifiers, no passives, no nothing for a 2% chance to get a master mission from a map? I think it's significantly higher than that. He says it's 10% to spawn any master at random, the 2.5% per. Yeah, I would find that very low. That number doesn't make sense to me, just given the number of master missions you have through your natural progression. Like when you're doing your first atlas completions. I'm not saying I know what the number is, but that seems so low. I mean, if the wiki says that, then they've probably researched it, right? But like, that doesn't make sense to me. Because you're typically in double digit master missions by the time you're in yellows and you've only done like 30 maps if that and that's if you're like doing it evenly and not going straight up the patch notes at some point yeah all right i guess i'll look into that thing more than later about whether all hands is good or not also my water break how could you that's okay Yeah, but that's that's what this is gonna be. Oh, you're talking about the base. Okay, I see, I see. So you're saying there's like a 2.5% chance to have a mission appear in a map, but that doesn't make sense because like Kirik, Kirik doesn't do that. Kirik cannot do that. Like I understand that Nico, Einhardt, June, and whoever the last orc is can. Alva. Maybe you just can't have Kirek in your maps. I thought Kirek would. I thought with this, Kirek would be, be appearing in your maps similar to how Zana used to. But then does he just have a 0% base? Does it turn him into a 2% base and turn the others into a 2% base? Hmm. I don't know. I'm very interested in this one, though. Having, like, a high chance of getting the Masters would be quite good. If you're assuming they're 2.5 base, based on it being a 10% to C1, and then you factor in Kirak and he adds 2.5 as opposed to just Kirak reducing the others, There is also something, I think it might be Ruthless that does something different. Because the Ruthless people, like, fully explored the Master Mission spawning. But I think Ruthless plays under special rules. It's why they can do, like, it's why they have blocking. Why they have, like, specific blocking. 
to be able to force particular masters and then also whether they get masters or league mechanics but i think that's a ruthless thing i don't think that's in the generic game Look at the second half of the page. Yeah, we'll get there, we'll get there. I know nothing about Ruthless. All I know is that the Ruthless people solved master missions for Ruthless. And they had huge write-ups on it. But we'll continue along. Maybe I'm overestimating how good this is. I don't know. Even going from like, so then you would go from a 10% chance to get a random master encounter to a 50% chance to get a random master encounter, but still be divided amongst your others. We'll see the rest. Maybe there's something else in here that you can block to try to keep it focused. Because if you can't keep it focused, it's probably not that good. That's kind of part of the beauty of collecting missions, right? Is then you can then allocate your Atlas passives to take advantage of the missions. So if this doesn't outweigh that, it would surprise me. Because then why does it exist? Then again, I mean, some of the passives are just bad, so. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive skill, Cassia's Pride, which grants Blight monsters in your map take 75% less damage from players and minions, and Blight Towers in the minions and your maps deal 300% more damage. I mean, this is okay, I guess. The problem I have with this Keystone is... If this was one point, I think it's fine. You're probably not going to be right beside this a lot of the time. Because... I don't know. Most of the Blight passes aren't even good. Like, some of them are good. The ones in the south are good, and then the ones for, like, the oils at the top are good. The ones on the left to, like, make it so that you can pay for Blight are okay, but then if you're paying for Blight, like, Scarabs exist. If you're an SSF, I guess it's fine. Even an SSF, I think you would just wait. First, you don't like the keystone because you can't bank stuff. Yeah, I can see that. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive, Speaker of the Dead, which grants Tormented Spirits in your map can possess players for 20 seconds, and Tormented Spirits in your map cannot possess monsters. This one's like a little weird. It's kind of cool because they showcased it that if you, if you get possessed, then you can then touch monsters to make them ghost touched which gives them a little bit of buff to their their drops and then you get you know the tormented spirit buffs but i think realistically you're still just gonna kill the spirits i think what this needed to say this keystone needed to say tormented spirits in your maps cannot die or are immortal or invulnerable or whatever because realistically you're gonna take this and then kill all the tormented spirits and you're gonna be sad or you're gonna like painfully wait for the tormented spirits to interact with you. But I think if you do that, it'd be fun. It'd be really fun. But as it currently stands, I don't think it's very good, unfortunately. Speaker of the Dead. Don't let's talk about avoiding shitty touch mobs and hardcore with this. They can still touch mobs, they just can't possess them. I guess you're avoiding the, like, anti-flask thing, right? Martyr? Martyr's been nerfed. Martyr doesn't do anything anymore. I mean, I guess that's a use. I don't know. This is another one that I think... It, it kind of has to be a one-pointer for you to even want to do that, though. Even then, I don't know. You'd have to chase the spirit, probably. You don't have to chase the spirit. If you're using it just to block possession, you don't care about the spirits at all. Because they can never be inside one of the mobs. Also, as a fervent believer of Seance, I cannot abide by this keystone. 
is ridiculous. Something that could be cool with it, I don't think it works this way, although it'd be really nice, is that if it if it makes it so that while you're possessed, you gain ghost loot drop benefits, it'd be huge. I doubt it. Dance is so monka? Why? Dance isn't scared at all. Ruckus can be a little monka. I've never thought Sans was scary on any character ever. Personally. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive, Endless Tide, which grants beyond portals in your maps cannot spawn unique bosses. Beyond portals in your maps have 50% less merging radius. This is the best Keystone you'll read. This is phenomenal. This is so ridiculously good. It blows my mind. The absolute worst thing about Beyond is you enter the map, you blast the first pack, and it procs a boss, and the rest of your map doesn't have Beyond anymore. This is so nice. I love this. I'm so happy to see this. I'm going to click this a lot of the time. Yeah, just in general. It's great. If they ever made it so that unique... You know, beyond bosses gave actual loot. Then I'd be sad, but this is great. Can you explain the merging radius? Yeah, so think of it think of it this way. Let's say let's say you have like a handful of rice, right? And you, you drop them from a height onto your desk. The ones that are tightly clustered will contribute towards a portal, and the ones that are like spread out are no longer close enough. That's the merging radius. When mobs die, they have a chance to proc towards beyond portals, which spawn monsters. And they are accumulating towards this invisible pool. And depending on what pool they're building into is based on where they died in relation to each other and their merging radius. Giving a one tainted chrome. Yeah, I, I don't understand why the beyond bosses give so little. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive skill, Arbitrary Tenants, which grants favors at ritual altars in your maps randomly cost between 90% less and 80% more. Why? This isn't good. This is only ever going to lead to heartbreak. So, okay, I kind of get the idea of this, right? So you take this and then you're just buying currency, like you're just buying generic currency that it's cheap. But you're going to cause yourself so much headache going through them and being like, is this one cheap? Is this one cheap? Is this one cheap? This one's expensive. This one's cheap. This one's whatever. And then for that benefit, which is like a small benefit, it kind of is a benefit, right? You're going to eventually see a good item and you can't d defer it. And you're going to never want to play again. The problem is getting good items to show up, not buying them. I don't agree with that. Ritual is very top-heavy, don't get me wrong. But there's plenty of things you can buy in Ritual consistently. That there's enough in every shop, especially with rerolling three times every time. That you'll have things to buy and they'll always be discounted. Well, your purchases will always be discounted, I should say. You know, discounted or within normal cost. That you'll you'll come out ahead on this. But there is a chance you will have a heartbreak. Everyone loves the random variants in Tujin and the Vault Ritual. Random variants in Tujin? What do you mean? So I think it's I'll come back to it. I think it's good. I think the benefits don't outweigh the chance that you're going to want to uninstall Path of Exile on the spot. Tujin sometimes has overpriced stuff. No, he just has expensive stuff. As far as I'm aware. Like, it's not, it's not overpriced. It's That is an expensive item. So he is selling it for a lot. Like, he has a, he has a premium outcome if you will we'll call it that 
I think this is good. I don't know if it's good enough. So the thing is, Zeno, you s you need to reevaluate what good is. That's the thing. Let me. F how do I phrase this properly? Okay, let's say this. You're going to see four pages, right? We're expecting the ritual. We're going to see four pages of rituals. There's going to be a smattering of currency, of maps, of the ritual splinters, and then we'll say random good items, like div cards, I don't know, ritual bases, yada, yada, yada. It doesn't matter, right? The point is, across those four pages, you're going to see more than you can buy. You're going to see, like, 40 items that... If you could, you would buy. And with this keystone, what you do is you just pick the ones that are cheap. So over time, you're getting a lot more. Because you're you're effectively just rotating those 40 items. And you're buying the first 10, the second 10, the third 10, the fourth 10, over and over and over at discount. But over time, over like 100 rituals, you're buying the same thing over and over, but at discount. Right? Something else that could be interesting with this, and I, I don't know how this is going to work, is what happens with deferred items. If I defer an item and it shows up in the next ritual order, altar, is the cost set already, or will it readjust? <laughs> I assume it's set and doesn't readjust, but that's that's also another like aside that could be funny. Yeah, I, I think it keeps the cost. So I, I'll i reevaluate. I think this is good. I still don't know whether it outweighs the heartbreak. But this is actually a significant increase to the amount you get to buy from Ritual. It's just you turn Ritual from the high roll into nickel and dime strategy, which could be good, right? Like consistency, consistency is something you want in your mapping strategies. So the more and more I think about it, the more I think Arbitrary Tenants is good. Just be prepared, you might face heartbreak. <laughs> you, you might just punch a wall one day. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive skill, Immutable Dogma, which grants cannot re-roll favors at ritual altars in your maps, and monsters sacrifice at ritual altars in your maps grant 100% more tribute. This is terrible. This is absolutely trash. So, like, the only time I would consider this is if you have, like, reserved a headhunter or something, and you're like, I want to try to buy it. But even then, you just want it to appear more frequently instead. I don't know. This does not seem very good to me. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive skill, Unending Nightmare, which grants Delirium Fog in your map never dissipates, Delirium Orbs cannot be found in your map, and Simulacrum Splinters cannot be found in your map. I don't like this. I personally do not like this at all. Ability reroll is huge. Yeah, for sure. I get that this can be used for, for slower builds. And that's cool. But how... What build do you have that is slow enough that you can't get consistently to like 5 rewards on Delirium? Which isn't a hard ask, right? Like 5 rewards is fairly low. Even without passives, but with passives, like, it's pretty easy to get. Like, how how hard, how slow is your build that you can't get to five rewards consistently, but you can clear delirium consistently and not be scared of the monsters, not be worried about the monsters? And something else to consider with this, because, like, the delirium orbs, like, delirium orbs are so useful. In SSF, in trade, and whatever, they're incredibly useful, they're very common, and like the Simulacrum Splinters, it kind of depends on what map you're running. Like some maps you're just going to get 5 Splinters even with like a full clear. Some maps you're going to get 100 Splinters because you're running Tropical Islands or Phantasmagoria, right? But something else to consider with this Delirium Fog, especially if you want to try to make the argument that like my build is slow or my build's not as good or my build's, you know, less than optimal. This is a downside. This is, this is like the heart of a Keystone. If your build isn't good at fighting the delirium monsters you can't get rid of the delirium off of the boss you have to be able to fight high delirium percent bosses 
So now your build has to hit the qualifier of your build is slow, but your build can destroy delirium monsters as well as f high delirium bosses. And for me, that is a very strange set of conditions to meet. As well as these are significant downsides. So I don't know. I am personally not a fan of this. But that's that's my thoughts on Unending Nightmare. Yeah. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive, Timeless Conflict, which grants Legion encounters in your map have no timer. Breaking out monsters and chests that are in stasis progressively causes a schism, and Legion encounters in your maps begin once the schism has occurred. So this is just you can like pick and choose the monsters, right? You can slowly go around, pick and choose the monsters, the bosses the the chest or whatever i think this is good this is so this to me reads what this wants to do which is your build is slower but you still want to be able to experience legion and i don't know if schism does anything weird to it but this this sounds like it's perfect right your build's slow your build has bad aoe your build has whatever you don't want to unleash a bunch of monsters you just want bosses you just want chests you have full control like this. This sounds like what this wants to be. And I'm all for this. This sounds great. If schisms are weird and they have like some specific modifier or something, then, you know, maybe not as good. But this sounds great. So one downside you can have with this, or it's not even a downside because you just wouldn't take it, is that if you're a build that relies on explosions or chains or, you know, whatever have you, then you don't, you don't want it to be this progressive, you know, piecemeal encounter. You want to break everything, open them all up. They're all aggro. They're all within nice explosion range, and then you blow up everything. All depends on how many rewards you can open. I mean, sure. Like I said, like we don't, I don't, I don't know the schism mechanic here. I don't know if anyone does. But if this is just your legions are in stasis and you can fight them as you want, fight whatever you want, it sounds great. If it has some kind of downside, which would make sense, because that's kind of what keystones do, in theory, then we'll have to see what that downside is. Do I really know what build you're at least starting with? No, I have no idea. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, if I can't think of anything, it'll probably be Bone Shatter, just given how strong it is, but I haven't, like, I'm still going through the patch notes right now, so... It's a bar that fills as you open stasis monsters. Our AQs has a picture. And once you're at the full bar, you can't break it anymore. Is that what it is? Or do they just like go away or something? I mean, even then it sounds great. Yeah, no, that sounds fun. Because like I said, like you don't you don't have to panic. You can you can go around. You can see what bosses are up. You can decide what bosses you want. You can look at the different rewards. You can pick and choose your rewards. You can look at monster modifiers. You can be like that monster has executioner. I hate that modifier. I don't want that. Right? I think it's great. We'll see. At the very least, like people just won't take it, right? Added a new... What were we doing? Crop rotation, right? Yeah. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive skill, Crop Rotation, which grants harvest crops in your map contain only tier 1 plants, and harvesting crops in your map has a chance to upgrade the tier of plants of different colors. What? Okay. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. So let's say you have four plots, right? They're all tier 1s, and you're like... This one has yellows, so you leave that for the end, right? You click the other ones, and you hope it upgrades the yellows. Gotcha. Done. So you save the best for last. I like that. That seems great. We'll have to, like you said, Hugh, like, we have to know the chance. We have to know whatever on it, but it sounds great. It's a chance to upgrade the tiers of plants of different colors. Yeah. That sounds great. You wouldn't use it with, like, sextants or anything. Actually, you might. I don't know. We'd have to see, like, whether you can end up with, like, multiple tier 4s or, like, a lot of tier 3s. You know, if you end up with four plot, four sets of plots and your fourth set of plot 
has, you know, 10 tier 3s in it, it's pretty good. It's pretty ridiculous. You know, maybe a tier 4. If you do a bunch of crop rotations, you have to take, you know, lesser colors in your final plot, your 4 plot. I guess you can have 4 or 5 plots, right? But, like, your 4th or 5th plot or whatever has 4 tier 3s, maybe 5 tier 3s. It's still good. It's not as good, though. And then you kind of have to weigh the fact that you weren't able to take the good colors earlier. But I like it. I think that's good. I like that. It's a little annoying that that first plot is literally worthless. The first one you click is like quite literally worthless, so you lose one of your plots. But I like it well enough. Yeah, yeah. Rock when you're able to do both plot choices too, I wonder. I don't see why I wouldn't. So yeah, I guess you could have more than four or five, right? You can have five, six, seven, depending on how lucky you are. Well, I guess it's like a 10% chance. So like It's like very low, right? Well, the whole thing, we don't know the chance. Yeah, but it'll be worked out fairly quickly, right? It's kind of the beauty of one of these ones, of, of this one in particular. Like, people will know very quickly whether this is good or not. And people will know very quickly whether it's good or not before people like me or other people are like in end game with your full passives setting up your harvest and all that stuff right which i like it kind of saves a few of the other atlas passives oh where you don't have to like dictate color yeah that's true added a new atlas keystone passive skill bold undertakings which grants fortune favors the brave applies an additional random option and a hundred percent more cost of fortune favors the brave crafting option this sounds Interesting. So you don't get double benefit from the central point. You have a much higher chance of getting the random Atlas choice that you wanted. It costs six chaos each. Six chaos is a lot. We'll come back to this. I don't I don't know how I feel about this. If if a bunch of Atlas passive or Atlas choices, like the Kirak map choices were you know, 15 chaos, 20 chaos, something of that nature, I think I could see it being worthwhile. But if you're at the point where you're paying 6 chaos for something, you know, what is it, 8 take 2, and the things that cost the most are like 10 chaos, it doesn't sound very good to me. It doesn't sound very good to me at all. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive skill, Overloaded Circuits, which grants League Map Crafting Options also choose three random notable Atlas passive skills associated with that League the treat is allocated, and 100% more cost of map crafting options. Okay, sure. So, if you click, you don't have to like reallocate your thing, I guess. This sounds terrible too. This sounds like a cool alternative to Fortune Favors the Brave. This one right here. But this is so expensive. And if you're at the point where you're pumping a ton of chaos into map crafting options. Then you would just have the Atlas passives allocated. So like... How many essence notable, mod essence notable modifiers are there? There are four. But it's not like the miners aren't good. And once again, like, paying double cost is a lot. I don't know. This, this seems suspect to me. I don't like the idea of this one. This doesn't bypass Wandering Path, right? They'll be allocated, but you'll still have Wandering Path, so they don't do anything, right? wonder if it can choose notables you already have allocated. I assume so, yeah. It'd be similar to if you had, like, allocated something on your passive tree and then wore an anoint, would be my guess. I don't know if I like this.
Yeah, I'm not a big fan of this. I mean, it's better than I think it is, though. Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to see what the, the league map crafting options are further down. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive. Meticulous Appraiser, which grants modifiers to quantity of items found in your maps instead apply to rarity of items found in your maps at 300% of their value. That's interesting. You get no quant bonus. But you get giga rarity. Somebody smarter than me would have to actually take the values from PoDB of, I don't know, we'll go with like, you'd have to go with like a random rare, a map boss, a unique monster, and norm monsters. Someone's going to have a spreadsheet for this. Something to consider is that rarity and quantity both have diminishing returns in this game, right? Losing quantity really sucks, because you lose... I mean, you lose currency, but does currency really matter? You have a lot of different currency sources that aren't quantity-based. Like League Mechanic Reward Modifiers. Losing quantity is really bad for things like Harvest and Expedition. Expedition's really good for rarity, though. The multiplier. Like, it's multiplicative, the rarity bonuses from Expedition, from your character, and then from the map, all of them. This is map modifier. Modifier is the quantity of items found in your map. Hmm. Interesting. It doesn't. People are mistaken about that. People have been confused about that since Arc Nemesis. It's not. It's not more complicated. People are just conflicted, or confused. What's the word? Not confused, but they're... They're mixing it up with something that happens with Arc Nemesis conversion. I think Chris said it will come in at 3.22. When did he ever say that? Or the Po 2. When did he ever say that? Instead of ExoCon talking about Po2 bosses. Gotcha. Yeah, it has no impact on currency currently. I think there was once upon a time it did, but then it got either fixed or changed or something. I remember Slippery Jim did something on it. But either way, so you lose, you lose div cards, you lose maps, which is not insignificant. You lose currency. You gain a little bit from conversion, but conversion then also gets destroyed by a lack of quantity. I think it's good. But I think it's only good if you're doing things like MFing legions or expeditions. Or just general seance is probably really good with it. I think... Rogue Exiles is also really good with it. Rogue Exiles and Ruckus and all that stuff is really good. Probably. Do I have a th Soul Thirst build guide? I do not, I'm sorry. Legion Breach. Breach is terrible though. Just in general, Breach is not good. Breach is okay for like the big MFing groups or whatever, but even then. I think this could be very fun to play with with Ruckus and Ghost. The problem is that, like, I have to do that in a trade league, because then I'll just... I don't know, do you even have to? Because one of the problems is that you're going to have a serious lack of map drops, but you can always make up map drops with things like, you know, the Atlas passives. Even if you're not under Wandering Path, you can have adjacency and whatnot. 
I would be surprised if it does. It shouldn't. But I have no idea. As to whether rarity affects the breach specific uniques in map drops. But I would be very surprised if it does. Yeah, I'm not sure about this. I think it's good. I think it's really good. I think it's going to get used more than it should. But I think it's good. Added a new Atlas Keystone passive skill, the seventh gate. If you have any questions, by the way, about Soul Thirst, I can try to help you out, TBD. But as far as like having a guide, no, I never got around to it. It wasn't really much to make. There have been people who have made Soul Thirst guides, not to like, you know, tell you to go find it or whatever, but Soul Thirst is a pretty well laid out mechanic, thankfully. You can even see people who do it like day one, day two, without like the full everything. Me try the self chill RF build you did. If it's still viable, it should be. I never made a non. I never made a budget version, but like, you can you can make up the resistances and all that stuff without having a mage blood. I think it's not that bad. I wouldn't league start that for sure, because you're going to need quite a bit of currency just to make sure the damage is high, so you're clear. But as like a second or third build, it'll be pretty good. Providing things don't change. I'm still going through the patch notes. <laughs> uh, seventh Gate, which grants all possible league mapping, map crafting options are available while six gateways are allocated. Ew. That's so many points. But I guess that's cool. Ugh. Okay, I like that that exists. I don't like how it exists. This is such a heavy tax. Because gateways are never efficient. The The ones at the very bottom that connect, like, the right side of Intervention and the left side of Einhardt arguably can be used to good effect. But the, the ones in the middle and the ones at the top are just never efficient. So you're, you're eating a lot of points for this. But, having access to any league map crafting options, you know, ideally going forward, is something that's great. It's a little tragic what's attached to it. <laughs> I don't know how you would have made this better. I think I would have rather this said it costs 50% more, or 100% more. In chaos and not this like you lose what's probably going to be more than seven points like it's not just going to be your six gateways and the seventh gate you're going to lose like 10 or 12 points to this and 12 atlas passives is a lot that is a crazy amount but i don't know maybe they reworked the tree and the gateways are more suitable and you're only really losing like six points or something but i don't know Holding alt on a currency item or stackable fragment will now show the counter of that currency or fragment within the same inventory, including trade windows. I mean, that's cool. It's honestly not that useful. Like, people who are getting scammed already don't use the, the safety nets available to them. But it is nice to not have to be as vigilant. You can kind of just check at the end. Continue to incrementally improve the sound, art, effects, and environments. Alright, Forbidden Sanctum changes. The Forbidden Sanctum has been added to the core game. You initially meet Divinia in the Oriath docks in Act 10, who provides you with access to the Forbidden Sanctum. The Forbidden Sanctum has a maximum area level of 83. Introduced Forbidden Tomes, which are tradable items that can, are found in the endgame. A Forbidden Tome represents the entire first floor of the Forbidden Sanctum, and its rooms can be played back to back. Upon successfully completing a Sanctum floor, the next floor is generated as a tradable item with the state of your Sanctum built in, including your boons, afflictions, resolve, relics, and Nolarius. Relics have also returned and are now tradable. They are locked in at the beginning of the first Sanctum floor and cannot be changed for the remainder of the Sanctum run. Completing a Forbidden Sanctum run now requires killing Lucia in both her first and second form. She will always drop a unique relic, which have also been reworked and replaced as we rebalance the Forbidden Sanctum. Primary defenses now have some effect on protecting your resolve. Armor provides resolve mitigation from enemy hits, 
Evasion grants a chance to avoid resolve loss from enemy hits, while Energy Shield provides you with Resolve Aegis, which is a mechanic that behaves similarly to how Energy Shield behaves for life. The difficulty of Forbidden Sanctum has been increased, especially in the later floors. Monsters generally have more life and deal slightly more resolve damage. Rare monsters can be found within the Forbidden Sanctum, and completing a room now requires killing all rare monsters present. Ew. Does that mean you can't skip rooms anymore? Like the, the run to the end rooms? I guess so. Monsters in the Forbidden Sanctum are immune to damage if there are no players within 100 units of them. Rude! Boons and Afflictions have been reviewed and rebalanced. We've also added new Boons and Afflictions themed around the new defensive mechanics. The Rusted Mallet Minor Affliction that causes monsters to have knockback has been removed. That's great. That was really rough with uh, Lysia. Relic Modifiers have also been reviewed and rebalanced. We've also added new Relic Modifiers for the new defensive mechanics. We have also added more hazards and room variety to the Forbidden Sanctum. The Forbidden Sanctum has been adjusted for Ruthless. Atlas changes, here's a bunch of maps, here's a bunch of maps gone. Anything really notable. We have Academy, Acid, Caverns, Arena, Basilica, Bazaar, Bog. I love Bog. Cage, Carcass, Channel, Courthouse. Courthouse is pretty sweet. Estuary is great. Dark Forest is whatever. Forking River, Glacier. Glacier's cool. Grave Trough, Graveyard, Haunted Mansion. Those are a bunch of brutal maps. Haunted Mansion's a sweet map. Good for, um, Thief Card Farming. Just general farming. Iceberg, also good map. Ivory Temple, Lava Chamber, Lava Lake. Lava Chamber, I remember talking about this. We'll see what the div cards are in Lava Chamber and whether Lava Chamber is going to be incredible for Kirak farming or not. Also, whether Kirak farming is still a thing or not. Lookout, Mausoleum, Mesa, Mud Geyser, Palace, Pen, Reef, Spider Forest, Summit, Sunken City, Vault, and Waterways. Uh, Muddies are okay. Mesa's great. Yeah, Cage is okay early league. Getting six links. Following maps have been removed. Air Lake, Armory, Arsenal, Belfry, Canyon, Conservatory, Coral Ruins, Core, Crater, Crimson Temple, Crystal Ore, Defile Cathedral, Desert Spring, Dig, Dry Sea, Fields, Forbidden Woods, Foundry, Grotto, Jungle Valley, Laboratory, Lair, Lighthouse, Marshes, Overgrown Ruin, Plaza, Ramparts, Relic Chamber, Scriptorium, Shipyard, Shrine, Toxic Sewer, and Waste Pool. We lost Sewer and Waste Pool? Unforgivable. I mean, we get stuff like Mesa, right? Like, we get Mesa and Bog. But that's sad. I love those maps. I mean, where are some other notable losses? We lost, you know, some of the, the Crimson Farming. You lost Defiled Cathedral. You lost Crimson Township. But you got Haunted Mansion in its place. Air Lake was really good. But that's just Bog now. Army. Army is really good. Yeah, I guess whatever to the rest of that. I say Temple, not Township. Yeah, the ones that we currently are going to have are Haunted Mansion and Crimson Temple. Grave Trouble will see one run for completion. <laughs> yeah, I don't particularly like that map. Map tiers and locations have been shuffled, though the pin locations for maps have not changed. Most maps are now initially found at a different tier. Some of the map bosses you are required to defeat to upgrade your Pantheon have been changed to resolve these Atlas changes. Crafting recipes that were previously unlocked in maps that have been removed from the Atlas are now found within other maps currently on the Atlas. Some divination cards have been moved. Scarred Meadow and Tranquility can now be found in Orchard. The Whiteout can now be found in Channel. Unique maps are no longer offered as a mission when re-rolling Kirag missions with Explorer Scouting Import. No, this was so good. This is a different thing that people were doing. And I did it a little towards the end in like private leagues. So explore scattering reports, they re-roll it. And then you get a bunch of the maps that you haven't completed. It also worked for unique maps. It wasn't, it didn't force the unique map every time, but if you rolled a unique map, it would try to use one of the ones you haven't completed. Doesn't this buff uncompleted map rolling though? Like incredibly minor. I would rather it exist. But sure, technically. Like a really, really small amount. And even then, you don't... That's not necessarily true. Because it could have been it generated a unique map on top of the maps that were appearing anyway. I doubt anyone has ever, like, gone and looked at ha what the average spawning of maps is. So, like... I don't, I don't think this is good. 
It's fine that this went away, but I'm sad about it. The section modifiers that cause the final map boss in each map to drop an additional Shaper Guardian, Elder Guardian, or Conqueror map have been changed to drop upon completing your maps. Well, that got nerfed real fast. When Well, it got nerfed in relation to the thing that we were about to do with the, the Maven witnessing. When adding the new Lucid Dreams Keystone Atlas passive, we also took time to review all side areas and maps and the modifiers present on them. All modifiers except one no longer grant additional packs of Corrupted Vault monsters. This has been moved to an implicit modifier instead. Modifiers with upside no longer have increased item quantity or item corruption chance, unless that is the only thing they do. Modifiers with downsides no longer have variable item corruption chance. This is now a fixed value relative to the perceived difficulty of the modifier. Vol side areas can no longer roll regular map modifiers. Modifiers that add extra monsters are now suffixes. The explicit item corruption chance modifier has been removed. The values provided by modifiers has also been rebalanced. Added some new modifiers, including one that causes vol vessels to contain an additional level 21 corrupted gem. It's pretty sweet. Map bosses and corrupted maps no longer have the corrupted tag and no longer drop additional vol items. That's annoying. The Vol Temple map can no longer be obtained outside of Corruption, Vol Side Areas, or Divination cards. What? What was the source that's not those? Kirak? So you probably like can't buy them from Kirak, you can't get them in Kirak missions anymore? That's fine-ish. It's a little sad, but that's fine-ish. The Beastcraft obtained from Einhardt's memory of Harvest Beast that created a Vault Temple map now creates a Synthesis Unique map. It's a huge buff. That is a gigantic buff. I think map drops in Vault sides, like Corrupted ones. Yeah, but that's Corrupted. Right, Sina? That would just be Corrupted still. That's a huge buff, though. You get Synthesis Unique maps now. You can get Cortex off that. Like, it's random, but... Similar to the card turn-in, like, you can get Cortex off that. Don't say it like that, Sin. Why you gotta be that way? We've also added three un new unique Vol side areas. Happy hunting. This I'm excited about. Because I love new things. This is new. I do like Vol side areas. I always have. Atlas passive tree changes. The shaping the sea and the shaping the valley Atlas notable passive skills have been removed from the Atlas tree and the new bold undertakings and overloaded circuits keystones have taken their position. There are now six Atlas passive skills in this cluster, previously five, which each provide maps found have a 5% chance to be 1% tier higher, previously 4%. Added a new map cluster to the Atlas passive tree, the notable shaping the world, partially compensates for the loss of shaping the valley and shaping the seas. It provides final map boss in each map has a 5% chance to drop an additional connected map, and maps found have a 10% chance to be one tier higher, while the two small atlas paths of each provide maps have a 5% chance to be one tier higher. I mean, that's cool. Sure. I don't think it'll be used. Because typically if you're doing like connected map strategies, you're wandering paths, so you don't really get to use this, but it might be okay for early leak. Like really, really, really early leak. Added a new Beyond Cluster to the Atlas Passive Tree. There are three new notables in the cluster. Swarming Hive grants Beyond Demons in your map about a 100% increased chance to be followers of Katash. 30% more divination cards found from Beyond Demons in your maps to their followers of Katash. Pale Clarion grants Beyond Demons in your map about a 100% chan increased chance to be followers of Bidat. And 30% more basic currency items found from Beyond Demons in your maps to their followers of Bidat. Voracious Throng grants Beyond Demons in your map have a 100% increased chance to be followers of Gore, and 30% more unique items found from Beyond Monsters in your maps that are followers of Gore. I mean, so everyone's going to click Katash, right? Like, all the big farmers are just going to Katash. Scourge currency is not basic currency, right? The being followers of Bidet doesn't actually give you the debt currency, or like Scourge currency. I mean, 30% more unique items isn't the worst. You can combine that with the rarity Atlas passive. You can have some fun with that. The four small Atlas passives in the cluster each grant 5% increased quantity of items dropped by Beyond Demons in your map. 
Let's go. So many peon cards, what's it called again? Oh, the one that gives the the breach splinters. <laughs> Added a new torment cluster to the Atlas Passive Tree. The notable paranormal meeting grants your maps are haunted by an additional tormented spirit. While the three Atlas Passive each grant tormented spirits in your maps of 25% increased duration. This is terrible. Added a new vault side area cluster to the Atlas Passive skill tree. The notable, unimaginable horrors grants unique bosses in vault side areas in your maps deal 30% more damage. Unique bosses in vault side areas in your maps have 100% more life. And vault side areas in your maps have a 20% chance for awards from vault vessels to be duplicated. The three small atlas passives each provide your maps have a 2% chance to get a vault side area. This is okay. We need to see... So there's like several things that come into play with this, right? We don't know the new rewards. And we don't know the unique areas and whether this applies to the unique areas i assume it will like the the new unique ones these ones here the three new ones but this sounds fun it's nothing crazy it sounds fun all side areas in your yeah that sounds fun you go for gore probably or the beyond sword edge of madness that's it oh yeah <laughs> Uh, but, 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 uh, another adjacent map drop chance, small passive skill has been added around hunting season, archaeology, tour, convert stakeouts, and mining partnership. Make space for all the new all hands keystone. Sure. Sturdy construction atlas passive skill no longer has blight towers in their minions to map deal 20% more damage. Instead, it now has blight monsters in your map take 12% increased damage. Oh, okay. That's kind of cool. I think people still just never take that. I think even the people taking the keystone that gives you 300% tower damage still won't take that. They wouldn't have taken the old one. They won't take the new one. I don't know. Doesn't seem worthwhile to me. Just like a bunch of wasted points. The delirium difficulty and persistent small atlas passive skill that provides delirium in your maps increases 5% with distance from the mirror and delirium fog in your maps dissipate 4% slower have been removed from the Atlas Passive Tree. That's... bad. I guess they timed it up though, so you save some points, but those were good. I like those. Like, that was the thing, like, where I was talking about... Those, those are the passives, like, the passives and those miners that got removed. Like, you would just take all of that if you were struggling with Delirium, but you could still clear Delirium. And then you would clear your deliriums you would still get the five six seven stacks and you would get orbs and you would get splinters like i don't know it's a little i'm a little disappointed what they did with the delirium stuff personally the seance don't you dare the seance and unrelenting torment notable atlas passives have been swapped locations in the atlas tree Ooh, ooh, that's a good one that's a real big buff oh but the miners didn't change did they so it's kind of irrelevant. So the miners leading up to Seance give you 20% more item drops from tormented monsters. Possess monsters, whatever you will. So like the miners leading up to Seance are very important. Especially since they like, I assume are multiplicative with unrelenting torments 30% and then your map modifiers and all that stuff. I'd like to think that's going to be more relevant than it is, but I think it's mostly just going to be used for people who want to use the sextants that make it so that your possessed monsters drop scarabs without having to path all the way over there. Like if you're Eater of Worlds aligned, you're on the right side of the tree, but you can still be in the middle for the harvest, the expedition, the whatever have you, and then just pick up Seance for a few points. Not really looking to get value out of the Seance monsters, just more that there are possessed monsters so you can use those sextants. Otherwise, if you're somebody who's farming tormented monsters, you're probably just taking both wheels anyway. There's a world where you don't take the, the new Seance wheel in the center of the tree now, and you just take Unrelenting Torment and the smalls if you're doing like Rogue Exile farming, I guess. But otherwise, I don't think it's that relevant. 
if they swapped the small passives with the notables, then I think it's really good. Then I think you will see a lot of people take Seance in the center of the tree and not Unrelenting. But if the small passives are the same, then I think you just take both still. Some other Atlas passive skills have been moved location to make space for the new keystones and clusters added. Why not just, like, type it up? You're going to type up some of these other ones. Anyway, League Changes. Legion. The Dominion of Timeless Conflict now has a minimum area level of 80. Specific Timeless Emblems and Unrelenting Timeless Emblems no longer provide additional area levels. Additional area levels are now added based on the number of emblems used. Four emblems increases the area level by one, and five emblems increases it by two. Each unrelenting timeless emblem increases the area level by 0.5 area level, rounding down, meaning with five emblems, the maximum area level is 84. Sure. <laughs> okay. The 20% increase... Experience gain for each Timeless Emblem has been removed. Oh no, the five-way farming. Each Unrelenting Timeless Emblem now adds 10% increased experience gain, previously 20, and this is now stated on the item's tooltip. Each Timeless Emblem and Unrelenting Timeless Emblem now adds 50% more monster life, previously 10%, and now also adds 10% increased monster damage. The five-ways. They nerf five-way XP farm? Yeah, it looks like it. Although... So this is interesting. And I don't think people will do it. No, nah, it's fine. People would still do five ways. Yeah, it's just it's just worse. Something else to also note is not only is it worse, but getting access to eighty six items is harder now. Cause five ways used to give you eighty six items, right? From the rares at least. Which includes like the incubators and all that stuff, if I remember right. Maybe it was 84 items. I don't remember. But either way, in 80, a level 82 area is much worse than like a level 83 or 84 area. For just like general loot. Because you, you, you stop hitting breakpoints for tier 1 stats. But yeah, the experience also got demolished. I mean, you get, what, half experience, what you used to have? Maybe less, because you're at a lower level. To get something like 40% of the experience you used to get. Which is still an insane amount, especially, you know, if you're just AFK farming it. And by AFK farming it, I mean AFKing and someone else is farming it. Well, I see something for Torment and Spirit, that is wild. Okay. Delirium. The number of monster kills required to gain Delirium rewards in the following maps has been increased in order to be more consistent with other maps. Bramble Valley, Cold River, Crimson Township, Dry Sea, Forbidden Woods, Foundry, Frozen Cavern, Silo, and Stagnation. Has been increased? So it's harder to get Delirium rewards in those maps? Who's running these maps? What? The number of monster kills required to gain Delirium Rewards in the following maps has been increased in order to be more consistent with other maps. What? Who asked? <laughs> Who needed this? Who wanted this? Why is this a thing? I guess it matters for standard. Who's running Bramble Valleys? Who's running Cold River? Is this, like, some meta I'm just not aware of? This is very strange to me, but sure. They're trying to equalize out Delirium. Torment. Tormented Spirits now have 20% more life per level from level 55, scaling up to 560% more at level 83. They'll still get one shot off screen. They now have a tapering, less damage taken buff, which activates upon entering their range, and eventually scales down to no damage reduction after 15 seconds. For every enemy a Tormented Spirit touches, Increases the damage the spirit takes by 5%. Their AI has also changed quite considerably. The spirits now more aggressively touch monsters that aren't already touched, and more aggressively possess rare and unique monsters. Stats that add tormented spirits to an area are now consistently described as haunted by, instead of sometimes being contains. Sure, so using ghosts is easier now. That could be good. I mean, ghosting things is good. But... 
ghosting things is difficult, especially as your build gets better and better, it becomes harder and harder because you just killed the ghost. So we'll have to see how this goes. I wonder what this starts at. Does this start at like 99% damage reduction? Does it start at 20% damage reduction? I mean, this is a lot of damage increase. Like this is one pack they take, you know, 100% more damage. So we'll increase damage. The double shock. Okay, here's some guardian changes. Here's the chieftain changes. I guess I'll read them. Not everyone has looked at the spoilers or whatever. Harmony of Purpose. No longer provides. Nearby enemies cannot gain power, frenzy, or endurance charges. You and nearby party members share power, frenzy, endurance charges and 20% chance to gain power, frenzy, endurance charges on hit. It now grants linked targets and allies in your link beams have plus 5% to maximum elemental resistances. Enemies in your link beams cannot apply elemental ailments. And enemies in your link beams have minus 20% to all elemental resistances. Small ascendancy passive prior no longer provides 15% increased charge duration now provides the link skills have a 5% increased buff effect yeah I mean once again I don't particularly like the link skills in general I think they're very clunky for minions I've heard that they're okay for group play I don't really know this is this is sad to see I don't know <laughs> I don't like the the emphasis on linked being a core tenant of a class in a game that I feel is mostly played single player. And even though Linked exists for minions, it's terrible for minions. And I would like to see that changed first. Radiant Faith. No longer grants armor equal to 160% of your reserved life to you and nearby allies. Instead, now grants armor equal to 25% of your reserved mana to you and nearby allies. So this is kind of cool. This is good for everyone that wasn't a low life guardian. Kind of. It's kind of debatable whether you have this point available to take. But reserving your mana, I mean, you'll have like anywhere from 1,000 to like 1,600 mana without being a mana build. Which is, you know, an okay amount of armor. It's nothing crazy. The amount of armor you're getting from like a stock build with like 1,600 mana, if you will, being reserved versus just like a stock low life build, you're going to have way less armor. But... You can try to do goofy things where you have big mana. <laughs> I don't think you will. And then you reserve like half your mana. I don't know. It doesn't seem terribly good to me. But you can probably play like a big mana build that isn't all the way reserved. And maybe you can get like 3k, 4k armor out of this. And 4k flat armor is a huge amount. Don't get me wrong. But I don't know. It seems a little suspect to me. Unwavering Faith. No longer provides auras from your skills grant 1% physical damage reduction to you and allies. Or auras from your skills grant 0.2% life regenerated per second to you and your allies. So this is also something interesting that people might not understand. Is this gave it to every single one of your auras. Like if you had 5 auras, you got 5 instances of 1% physical damage reduction to your allies. As well as you know 5 instances of 0.2 life regen. And then if you had aura effect enough to the point where you could tip that over to two percent, they were each two percent. Like it, it it was really cool scaling. You could do some phenomenal things with this. I mean, outside of you know delirium aura stackers, that's typically a group play thing. Instead, it now provides auras from your skills, grant five percent increased recovery rate of life, mana, and energy shield to you and your allies. So I've looked at this and I think you can probably do some goofy RF stuff with this because you can stack a bunch of RS, like a crazy amount of RS, like 10 RS or something then you get 50% increased rate of not just life recovery but also mana and energy shield maybe you can do something with that but I don't know the problem I have with it is and like I kind of like the idea of RF Guardian but there just aren't enough points to take it's kind of the problem also, time of need got butchered. So, time of need no longer provides 80% reduced effect of curses on you. It now provides every 4 seconds remove curses and elemental ailments from you, and every 4 seconds regenerate 100% of your life over 1 second. Previously 30%. So, this is okay. The, the problem with this is that the curse removal might as well not exist. The elemental removal is mostly irrelevant. 
it can be a little useful for like shrugging off small shocks shrugging off small chills otherwise you're probably solving those problems and then another facet of if you are going to be trying to play something like righteous fire guardian you're probably taking this node just because like the you don't have other nodes to take and shrugging off the elements is fine but you have to reapply your righteous fire every time it's going to rip your righteous fire off every single time every four seconds so you probably have to left mouse button in your righteous fire just be aware of that Radiant Crusade no longer provides plus 20 to all elemental resistances. This is something that they've been consistently doing. They've been going around to all the different ascendancies as they're reworking them and removing, and they did it to the passives as well, the passive tree. They're just like removing a bunch of sources of resistances. No longer provides plus 20% to all elemental resistances. While there are at least five nearby allies, you and nearby allies have onslaught, or while there is at least one nearby ally, you and your allies deal 10% more damage. It now grants level 20 summon sentinel of radiant skill and 10 percent of damage from hits is taken from your sentinel of radiance life before you so 10 percent mom we'll call it mom it's not mom but like 10 percent damage reduction given to your sentinel it's cool like that's cool i don't know what the sentinel of radiance does i don't know if it's good i'm sure we'll find it down below maybe we'll just find it with the gem reveal the reveal the skill as well but it's going to really hinge on whether that thing is good. And losing the plus 20 elemental resistance, especially early on, is huge. You losing the onslaught is a little less relevant than some people might think. So, like, even as a Guardian Summoner, which is obvious, like, if you're taking Radiant Crusade, you were a Guardian Summoner, you typically didn't have onslaught a lot of the mapping to the point where it was probably right for you to use a Silver Flask if you were a very fast mapper. But you definitely had onslaught for bossing. And by bossing, I just mean like general map bossing or bossing in like arenas or, you know, your Eater, your Exarch, your early pinnacles, your Atlas completion. Like you would have the onslaught. You'd be faster. You'd be able to avoid mechanics easier. You'd have faster casting for summoning stuff like SRS. Your minions would be stronger. So like this, this summon Sentinel of Radiance is going to have to pull a lot of weight. And I would be surprised if it does, honestly speaking. It was good uptime on Don Blow, let's I feel, not so much on SRS. I don't feel like it was good uptime on Don Blow either, personally. Like, you just get to the point where you're so fast. Like the old onslaught for yourself. Unwavering Crusade. No longer provides nearby allies with 20% increased attack, cast, and movement speed. Nearby allies have 30% increased AoE. So both of these are very good. Nearby allies having 20%, like, effectively Onslaught on top of Onslaught, huge. 30% AoE, pretty good for Splash. Whether it be Dawn Blow SRS, whether it be, you know, Frost Blair Bearers, whether it be, you know, some other Spectre that people were using, I don't know. Like, 30% AoE is nothing to scoff at. Nearby allies Intimidate, as well as Unnerve, for 4 seconds on hit. So these were great. These were, you know, 10% increased damage. They're like baby shocks that you would consistently have. It now provides 25% chance to trigger level 20 summon elemental relic when you or nearby ally kill an enemy or hit a rare unique enemy. So something I like about this, if, it, if I'm reading this the way I am reading this, is it's nice to see that your allies, and by allies I mean your summons, can proc the elemental relic skill when hitting a boss and it doesn't have to be you wailing on the boss. I hope is how that reads. That being said, I have no idea what the Elemental Relic does. Once again, it's going to have to pull a considerable amount of weight, especially in the single target department, because your mapping speed is going to be shot, I feel. Like, even if you weren't getting these benefits all the time, just based on, like, your movement or, like, overkill or your enemies hitting something too many times and it was going to be dead anyway, like... You, you are going to be slower. And so to compensate for that, you're going to need this thing to pull an incredible amount of duty for killing single target. So just tanky rares, you know, expedition things, map bosses, whatever have you. I'm a little suspect of it. But once again, we haven't seen the stats of it, so I'll just reserve judgment. Bastion of Hope. This one I do like. 
Bastion of Hope. Well, I kind of did. I <laughs> I remembered something about it and then I no longer liked it. But Bastion of Hope no longer provides 50% chance to block attack damage for 2 seconds every 5 seconds. Or if you blocked in the past 10 seconds, you and nearby allies cannot be stunned. That is the part that I'm very sad to see gone. This was, it's not like stun immunity, but it was pretty close to stun immunity. It now provides, if you've attacked recently, you and nearby allies have 25% chance to block attack damage, previously 10%, and if you've cast recently, you and nearby allies have plus 25% to block spell damage, previously 10%. This is great. Like, you'll have near 100% uptime on both of those. And that is quite a bit of a block. But, it no longer grants the stun immunity, which is huge. Yeah, that's about it. It's good. It's a lot of block. You can scale block. Block's still a good stat. Even before you get, you know, life gain on block, ES on block, mana on block, whatever on block mechanic you're going for, it's a really good stat. This is not a small amount of block. Small ascendancy passive skills prior no longer provide 2% chance to block attack damage. Instead, it now provides 30% increased block recovery. Sure. So you effectively gain, what is that, 13%? Attack block and 15% spell block from previously. That's okay. Not having stun immunity though is gonna suck. But that can now POB without gem. <laughs> Bastion of Hope is an unconditional buff in this. Mm, I wouldn't say that. It kind of depends on what your build is. But there's gonna be a lot of times when people just like are lax and don't cast a spell. And your spell block's gonna be a little lower or something, right? But just between like a shield, tempest shield, and this, you have you're very close to spell block capped. If you have like a, the sanctuary wheel, which will help because you're missing the resistances anyway. Like this plus sanctuary, as long as you're you know vigilant about casting and attacking between like shield charge and flame dash and summons or whatever have you, right? You're pretty much spell block capped, as well as attack block capped, and that's incredible. It's a very rare thing to get. So I think this is a huge win. I think these are all not huge wins. <laughs> but, I mean, I have to see these skills. I don't like this because now you have to answer curses, whereas before you didn't. And, I don't know. Maybe this is okay. You can probably... This is probably going to read, like, 30% increased recovery rate for everyone. And then you can really go beyond it. Hinokora, so this is Chieftain. Hinokora Death's Fury. No longer requires Nengamahu's Flame Advance or Ramako Sun's Light. No longer provides 1% of fire damage to leech's life, cover rare or unique enemies, and ash for 10 seconds on hit, or 10% increased strength. It now provides enemies you kill have a 5% chance to explode, dealing 500% of their maximum life as fire damage. This is kind of cool. I don't think it's exceptional, but some applications for this could be... You gather, like, I don't know, you're doing, like, Simulacrum or something, right? You're, like, an Ignite build in Simulacrum. Or maybe Legion, they swarm. Maybe really high Delirium content that's not Simulacrum. Where you don't, it doesn't matter that most of the enemies aren't exploding. You're going to be able to prolif off the one guy in a pack that does explode and use that to try to kill a rare or a boss or something. It could be okay. I'm not too keen on it in general, and losing access to Ash is pretty bad for Chieftains, but I think you can have some fun use with this. I don't think it's good. I think it could be fun. Saleo's Cleansing Water. No longer provides plus 100% to fire resistance, 20% of physical damage from hits taken as fire damage, which was huge, or 20% increased life recovery rate if you've taken fire damage from an enemy hit recently. It now provides modifiers to fire resistance also apply to cold and lightning resistance at 50% of their value. The small ascendancy passive skill prior now provides 15 to fire resistance, previously 10. I mean, this is good. The big thing about this is that it leads up to whatever it's called now. Where is it? Oh, Valico. It's a precursor to Valico, and Valico's insane. But it's good. Like, not having to focus on your other resistances is pretty powerful. It's worse than before, unfortunately, but it's still pretty good. Yeah, like, you'll get quite a bit of resistance from it. You'll get more than the plus 100 fire resistance from this. 
It's just a question of whether you'll be able to compensate for the fact that you lost the 20% physics fire, which you probably won't, or the life recovery, which wasn't an insignificant amount of benefit for chieftains. Like, people played chieftain and then scaled life recovery because it was good at scaling life recovery. Yo, thanks for the follow, Freddy. Valico Storms Embrace now requires Salio's Cleansing Water no longer provides 0.5% of life per second per endurance charge. 15% more damage if you've lost an endurance charge in the past 8 seconds. Gain 1 endurance charge per second if you used a Warcry recently. Or plus 1 maximum endurance charge. Doesn't do any of that anymore. Now what it does, it provides modifiers to your maximum fire resistance also applies to your maximum cold and lightning resistance. The small ascendancy passive skill no longer provides a 5% chance to gain endurance charge and kill. Instead, it now provides 15 fire resistance. So, this is effectively melding with no downside, but it has to be fire resistance. Which is cool. It's extremely powerful. This is like, if Cheetan's going to be good, it's going to be because of this node. It's not hard to sca stack fire resistance. It's pretty common. It's already in the passive tree. Some things to keep note is unlike melding you can't do stuff like agus as well as one really s minor caveat is things like exarch exarch grates have minus fire minus max fire resistance it's not quite melding though is it why Oh, would it not be quite melding? I mean, you're limited to fire, but... This melding doesn't care about minus max cold lightning rows. This doesn't care about minus max cold fire rows. Oh, it says modifiers. It's not... It sets it. Oh. That's kind of annoying. Do those matter, though? When is that ever relevant? When are you, like, maybe Cirrus? Does Cirrus make you double dip? Do you lose cold and lightning twice? Because you lose fire and then you lose cold and lightning? Otherwise, when would it ever be relevant? When is it ever different? You're definitely right that it's different in that sense, but when does it matter? Because the only other time that I could think it would have mattered, leadership's price. That's a fair reason. That's a really fair reason. So you need plus three without downside leaderships as opposed to just plus three whatever leaderships. That's very true. You can definitely get beyond that. Yeah, thanks, Beck. Do not complete any map with six link chains and major playing character mission as a sub copium. Yeah, good luck with that, Fohan. Yeah, that's very true. And I guess it would have been relevant with Sanctum stuff, right? I mean, we were... 99% not to get the Sanctum stuff, but Sanctum stuff had positives and negatives. Okay, that's fair. I think it's still just as good in my eyes when I thought it was melding and not whatever this is. But something else to consider then. What does... Oh, so what does plus two all max res do for this? Because it'd be the same for Cirrus 2 on the other end. Is plus two max fire res, plus two all res, not plus two fire res, plus two cold res, plus two lightning res. So it's just plus two across the board, right? It doesn't do like plus two and plus four, plus four. It's just plus twos. I guess leaderships is insane for this. If you have a good leaderships then, right? Because if you have a plus three, plus three, plus three leaderships and they appear, like you can buy them. You can buy like three two twos, right? Then you would have 3 to your fire resistance, and then 5 or 6 to your cold and lightning resistance. Ooh. Maybe it's even better then. <laughs> so is it better than melding? Wait, it might be better than melding. <laughs> Wait a second. 3-2-2 thorough league, 3, two, two, three, two, three, three two, two never misses, it's true. It would be thematic to have a 3 two, 2 leaderships. What else would care about that? Where else do you have multiple instances of like split max res? 
Where else? Hmm. I mean, I guess you still just have like the shields, right? You could have a plus five fire shield, which gives you plus five all. It's not, that's just like a typical thing. Like melting does the same thing. Is there anything else that has split max res besides leaderships? So leaderships has it because it has like variable stuff, right? You have a crucible shield plus seven. Yeah, I know, I get you. Yeah, now that I think, now that you've brought up like leaderships, I think it's actually better than melding. You just need a good leaderships. Whoa. Oh. That's so much. Is it really better? So here's the question. It's only better until you get to 90 res, right? Because you're going to want 90 fire res at some point. And if you're ever at 90 fire res, then the extra cold and lightning don't matter again. I mean, it kind of matters for minus max stuff, but... That's cool. I'm going to consider it still melting. <laughs> it's definitely different than melting. But I don't think it's different enough for as many things. Maybe there's some tattoos that it'll matter for. Aero Hongi, Moon's Presence, no longer provides. Totems are immune to fire damage. Enemies near your totems deal 8% less damage. And enemies near your totems take 16% increased fire and fire damage. Or 25% increased area effect while you have a totem. Instead, it now provides Riku 25% of damage taken by your totems as life. Totems regenerate one life per second per four of your life recovery per second from regeneration. I don't think that's very good. And totems taunt enemies around them for four seconds when summoned. I don't think that's very good either. Because that's that's literally just a mastery. But I think Riku 25% of damage taken by your totems is life is incredible. The problem is, this is the kind of build where you would want... That's the kind of mechanic where you would want to be able to make Riku longer. Yeah, so like you can think of it in this way, right? If you're if you're playing like a melee build, you have three totems. It's like three or four totems. If you're playing like a totem build, like a dedicated totem build, not ballista, but just like a dedicated totem build, you have like four or five totems. If you're playing like ballista totem, you have like nine totems. And so you have nine targets that can all get blasted by some boss ability, and your regen, your Riku is just going to skyrocket. The problem is, this is a pretty big problem. This is a problem that plagues a lot of ascendancy nodes that doesn't do damage <laughs> it doesn't do damage and it doesn't increase your effective hp in that it doesn't affect your your one shot like not getting one shot but i do think it'll provide a ridiculous amount of recovery during bossing as well as just general mapping it's like it's one thing when you have to live off Riku for your own character because a lot of the times you're going to get hit for like let's say you get you hit for like 50% of your life a second passes although they're going to hit you again before a second passes you've recovered you know 12% of your life you hit for 50% of your life you recover 22 25% of your life or whatever you hit for 50% of your life you're dead right like it, it's not doing enough but if you're not taking all of the damage that is being fed into your Riku, I think it's good. I think it's really good. We'll have to see. Nagamahu, Flames Advance, no longer provides 50% of physical damage converted to fire, or every 10 seconds gain 100% of physical damage as extra fire for 4 seconds. It now provides non-unique jewels cause increases and reductions to other damage types in a large radius to be transformed to apply to fire damage, and non-unique Jewels cause small notable passives in the large radius to also grant plus three strength. That's extra. That wasn't there before. The free strength. That's a lot of strength. But I'm a really big fan of this one. If and only if it completely overrides. We were talking about this a few days ago when it got spoiled or whatever. Or maybe we we're just talking about Chieftain in general. But I'm a huge fan of it if it overrides. Like, so, like, let's say you have 
15% increased damage with axes. If that now says 15% increased fire damage, period, not 15% increased fire damage with axes like Fireborn does, it's it's really good, I think. I think it's incredible. Because you're already going to be using jewels. Now you get a bunch of strength, which is like free life, which is nice. As well as, you know, some utilization of strength. And ideally, you get to pick up a bunch of like utility cluster wheels that also give damage. Example <laughs> with axes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I wanted to not say that so that you can goof around with a lot of stuff. <laughs> but I doubt it will. I wonder how much strength that actually plays out to be. Like, let's say you're playing a strength stacker. I guess Strength Stacker wants to use, like, clusters, though, and travel very far. But even then, I don't know. That seems like a crazy amount of strength. That includes the travels, right? I don't know, I still think, like, right side ranger is fine. I still think shadow is fine. I think left side marauder is okay. I think duelist is fine. Maybe between ranger and duelist. I don't know how far down that reaches, though. It might not reach far enough down into, like, the bow stuff. But if it does, that one's okay. That's just a bunch of like fire attack stuff, as well as a fire mastery. Tawa Forest Strength now provides trigger level 20 Tawas, Tawahos. I don't know how to pronounce that. I will never know how to pronounce that. Someone will tell me how to pronounce that. I still won't know how to pronounce that. Chosen when you attack with a non vol slam or strike near enemy, strike skill near an enemy, previously non vol slam skill. The small sentency passive skill prior no longer gives you 10% ink AoE. Now provides 10% increased melee damage. I mean, this skill is just, like, not good, right? I think it still has a 2 second cooldown or 1 second cooldown. I don't know. We'll have to see what the cooldown is, especially for strike skills. I thought that this would be okay for strike skills just to give you a little more clear and, like, a small amount of single target damage. But even then, I don't know if it does. We'll have to see. Tsukuhama Wars Herald. That requires Nagamahu's Flame Advance. No longer provides 2% damage dealt by your totems. is leashed to you as life. 100% increased effective buffs of your totem ancestor totems grant while active, which is really nice. Where ancestor totems have 100% increased activation range. Now provides skills from equipped body armor are supported by level 30. It used to be 20. Level 30 ancestral call and skills from equipped body armor are supported by level 20 fist of war. You now gain 10% melee damage instead of 10% totem placement speed. So 100% increased effect of the buffs from your to Ancestor Totems was a crazy amount. There's a lot of damage. There's a lot of speed. You get... So Fist of War is good. Like Fist of War is just a skill that you use with slams. The problem with Fist of War is that you have to take the Chosen beforehand and the Chosen doesn't play well with slams. The AC was always level 30. I don't think so. I think it was first shown they were about 20. Maybe I'm mistaken, though. And AC is okay. Yeah, I mean, this is just... It's good. The problem is that the node leading up to it might not be. And that's pretty bad. And the thing that it replaced was good beforehand anyway. So, I don't know. I'm not too keen on it. This is a good amount of damage. For slams. It's an okay... Clear modifier for strikes. I mean, so something to consider about the strikes is that you don't have to have the mastery then, right? Which maybe gives you some play to your passive tree. You don't have to worry about strike on your clubs. But then, like, there really wasn't anything to take anyway. So, I don't know. 
Ramako, Sun's Light, no longer provides plus 25% fire damage over time multiplier, 25% chance to ignite, or damage penetrates 15% of fire resistance. It now provides nearby enemies fire resistance to zero against damage over time while you are stationary. Yeah, this is terrible. Like, so what? You, you get access to punishment now, right? You no longer have, if you're playing a fire damage over time build, you have punishment is your curse. Whereas before, you got to scale off of things like minus resistances through exposure, through elemental weakness, through flammability, especially with the curses being recently buffed. So I don't know. Like, it wasn't that hard to get things into negatives. You also had Scorch. Like, you have Scorch, Exposure, Double Curse. I'm sure there's more that I'm not thinking about. I don't know. This seems really bad. And then also, why does it have to be stationary? I don't understand that. If it's going to be stationary. What this should have said is nearby enemies have fire resistance of 0% against damage over time. Scaling up to, down to, whichever, like negative 60% while stationary. Like, if you stand still, it gets better and better and better. If you're moving, it's 0%. I think I would have been okay with this. Otherwise, this is just like, bad. This is really bad. This is never active while you're clearing, except... Okay, it is for like a split second, because when you shield charge, you stop moving for a second, but not very long. And by second, I mean like 0 0.01 second. Otherwise, like, even when you're bossing, even when you're mapping, a lot of the times you want to be moving around the boss, just because it's like a good habit to avoid damage. I don't know. The payoff for this seems so bad. I'm not a fan at all. Ascendant. Guardian. Oh, God. Okay, I'm just going to read what it does now. It doesn't do any of the old stuff. It now provides RS from your skills, grant 3% increased recovery of life, mana, and energy shield to you and your allies. Recovery rate. If you've attacked recently, you and nearby allies have 10% chance to block attack damage. If you've cast recently, you and nearby allies have 10% chance to block spell damage. It now also provides every 4 seconds regenerate 50% of your life over 1 second, previously 20%. It's significantly worse than it was before. You no longer have the RS being shared. You no longer buffer out Onslaught. You no longer have this massive amount of physical damage reduction. You now have slight a bit of recovery. I mean, I just don't think it's that good at all. Chieftain, you no longer provide 40% increased fire damage, regenerate 2% life per second, or 1% of damage dealt by your totems is leashed to you as life. It now provides totems taunt enemies around them for 2 seconds when summoned, unaffected by ignite, and 10% increased strength. Whoopee. I don't know. This is good. This seems terrible. I can never see myself taking Chieftain as an Ascendant node. Even if you're strength stacking, I don't see taking it, right? They're just better things to take. <laughs> I don't know, this seems terrible. Totem Taunt is a very powerful mechanic, but like, you can get it as a mastery. <laughs> this is like, not a small cost. Well, it's then it gets to keep the strength buff? Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> Listen. You also got a strength buff, okay? You get three strength per node around your jewels. Big strength. I have a question about the Chieftain non-unique jewel thing and increased damage diminishing returns. What's your question? Who got the pipe? <laughs> Occultist. What? Due to the discovery of a bug where Frigid Wake was incorrectly using a fixed duration freeze, causing it to not be affected by freeze duration modifiers, we have made the below change. The described bug has also been fixed. Bridge Awake no longer has every 4 seconds 33% chance to freeze nearby chilled en unique enemies for 0.6 seconds or every 4 seconds freeze nearby ch chilled non-unique enemies for 0.6 seconds. It now has every 4 seconds 50% chance to freeze nearby non-frozen enemies for 0.6 seconds. That's... Okay, why? Very strange. Fox's starter RF has a bunch of fire, some of it's on the tree. What percentage would need to be worth for the ascendancy node, do you think? 
what for like passives for you to be clicking? Is that what you're asking? So ideally, I guess the way you would find that out is ideally, I'm doing something in the background. No, I get you. Ideally, you would set up, you want your Atlas, not your Atlas, your Ascendancy Notables to be at least 20% damage. So, and you want your Passive Tree to be at least 4% damage per point. So you need to figure out whatever you can allocate, if you can, that that would happen. And then you can factor in some amount of the life gain from the strength. And whatever you value that at. And then you would just go around from node to node and try to figure it out. It would just depend on whatever your current gear is and your plan tree and whether your plan clusters you're taking as well as the notable fulfill that or not. Passive skill tree balance. Added a new fire damage with attack skills cluster to the passive skill tree to the southwest of the Marauder's starting location. The Lava Lash notable passive has been moved onto the new cluster, which contains two other new clusters. Settling Ash, which now provides nearby enemies, are covered in Ash if you haven't moved in the past two seconds. Ugh. I mean, Ash is really good, but like... Ugh. Two seconds? And Concussive Force, which provides hit stun as though dealing 50% more melee fire damage. Huh. And Ignites from stunning hit melee hits deal 20% more damage. What? What? Okay. This is very strange. Added a new Ignite and Bleeding Duration Cluster to the passive skill tree to the southwest of the Marauder's starting location. The notable cauterization provides that bleeding enemies cannot inflict bleeding on you. And ignited enemies cannot ignite you. Harvester of Foes Cluster has been shifted slightly down to make space for the new cluster. They sound terrible. I wouldn't want either of those. Like, so I get the idea that you play a bleed build and then you don't have to worry about bleed, but a lot of the times you're just... Enemies are going to hit you every now and then before you hit them, so you still have to have an answer to bleed because you're going to get blood every now and then. So then why do you have this node? The ignite one, I can give a little more leeway to. Because there's so few igniting creatures in the game that matter. But even then, just answer the ignite in a different way. Added a new fire damage with attack skills cluster to the passive skill tree to the southwest of Duelist's starting location. The notable Invigorating Blaze provides plus 10% fire damage over time multiplier with attack skills. And recover 2% of life when you ignite a non-ignited enemy. That's kind of cool. The Champion of the Cause and Bannerman Cluster have been moved to Lava Lash's old location to make space for the new cluster. Champion of the Cause got moved one down. That sucks. That's going to cost a lot of builds one point. Eh, maybe not. Because a lot of people are pathing to the axes anyway. Maybe it does the opposite. Maybe it saves them one point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it should save people one point, actually. That's kind of cool. Magmatic Strike's notable passive skill no longer provides gain 10% of physical damage as extra fire damage. Well, that's sad. 
Instead, it now provides every 10 seconds gain 30% of physical damage as extra fire damage for 4 seconds. Piss off. Nobody likes these buffs. Stop it. Also, that's incredibly scuffed to just, like, take Chieftain's nodes and put it on the passive tree. Like, especially with a node that people didn't like. The Dirty Technique's notable passive skill no longer provides 10% damage over time multiplier for ailments. That's unfortunate. Dirty Tech was a really good notable. It now causes damaging ailments to deal damage 15% faster as opposed to 10%. The two small passives prior now cause damaging ailments to deal damage 5% faster instead of 15% increased duration of ailments on enemies and 15% increased damage with ailments. That is a significant nerf. Because of that one. Duration of ailments is really powerful. It's kind of hard to get, especially for things like poison. And then, I don't know. I mean, you still have unbound, but still. I feel like that's worse. The Vention Cascade Anointed Notable Passive Skill no longer provides 15% increased projectile speed. It used to get 15% increased projectile speed? Attack projectiles return to you, or returning projectiles pierce all targets. Instead, it now provides returning projectiles have 150% increased speed. It's trash. Cool. Quality on the Anomalous Faster Projectile Support now grants projectiles from support skills to have 0-10% to chance to return to you. Previously, 0-60%. The Timeless Jewel Exclusive Strength of Blood Keystone no longer provides 1% less damage taken for every 2% life recovery per second from Leech. Instead, it now provides 2% additional physical damage reduction for every 3% life recovery from Leech. Well, that sucks. That got nerfed because people like time and time and time and time and time and time and time again would make it so that you can get Immortal to Strength of Blood, and they're just like, enough. Enough. Stop doing that. Added a new charge mastery. Nearby enemies cannot gain power, frenzy, or endurance charges. That's actually kind of nice. I don't like that it says... Okay, I need to know how big that nearby is. If that nearby is your entire screen, it's really good. Because it'll make some dangerous map modifiers, as well as, like, invitation modifiers, not as relevant. If that is, like your arm span it's terrible actually if it's anything less than your screen it's terrible but it's actually not that bad of a node endurance charges tend to brick people pretty hard as far as like your clear speed and then frenzy charges are terrifying on bosses do it for guardian nodes as well the totems taunt enemies around them for one second when summoned. Totem Mastery has been replaced with 1% of physical attack damage dealt by your totems is leads to you as life. Well, okay. Well, I guess the Mastery's gone. Figured it out. Crumpling XD. Thanks for the follow. Ugh. That really sucks. Totem Taunt was really good. Skill Balance. Temporal Chain Skill Gem now has other effects on cursed enemies expire 25% slower at all gem levels as opposed to 40%. Eee. Unlucky. Rip Poison. And by Rip Poison, I mean Poison still does plenty of damage, just less now. Vol Summon Skeletons now summons one Skeleton Mage at gem level 1, previously 0, scaling up to 5 at gem level 20, unchanged. Whoopee. If dual wielding when using Whirling Blades, you now attack with both weapons, dealing the damage of both in one hit. Whirling Blades now has, when dual wielding, deal 75% of damage from each weapon combined at all gem levels. Why do they hate Temp Chains? Because Temp Chains was super overpowered. This is interesting. Can we play Whirling Blades? Does Whirling Blades have a damage modifier on top of that? It should, right? I'd have to look up Whirling Blades. But I actually honestly don't care enough to look up Whirling Blades. Ruthless Support now causes Ruthless Blows with support skills to deal more damage with ailments caused by melee hits. Previously, more damage with bleeding caused by melee hits. Nice. And that's great. That's huge for Ignite. That's an incredible buff for Ignite. I'm stupid, but totally going to play a Melee Ignite build. I think Melee Ignite's fine. I played, was it, Ice Crash a long time ago? It was good. 
You have to play Ruthless to get it. <laughs> Combustion support now has intelligence and strength attribute requirements instead of pure intelligence. Sure. Unseen strike triggered by the hidden blade unique dagger no longer has a cooldown of 0.5 seconds. Does it have a cooldown? Huh? What? <laughs> Is it like a giga buff? It didn't blade already had builds before. Is it in blade nuts now? I'm so confused. Added the orb tag to the cremation skill gem. Um Can't you only have one orb? Where's Where's the rest of my cremation words? What? Why? I'm so confused. I don't I don't know the full implication of that, but I'm confused. Unique balance. Oh no. The Alberon's Warpath unique boost now also has summon skeletons cannot summon more than one skeleton warrior. This changes affect existing versions of the item that have summoned skeleton warriors or permanent follow you. Why did this need to get nerfed? Like, I understand you can just, like, stand there and spam your one skeleton at a time until you have your full army, and then you have your full army. But, like, why? Why was this necessary? And turns off a lot of supports? Yeah. The Delve Exclusive Shield prefix modifiers that provides plus three to max resistances can no longer roll. That's annoying. The Veiled modifier, which grants increased duration of ailments you inflict while focused modifiers now has values of 36 to 40%, previously 81 to 90%, which was previously even higher than that. Previously, like, double that, right? Crafted versions of the modifier have also been adjusted accordingly. The crafted version is going to be, like, 20% increased duration of ailments. Flask modifiers that grant a percentage of life recovery to minions now grant much higher values to account for minion life scaling to higher values than players, particularly in the end game. Previously, tiers ranged from 51 to 80%, now they range from 100 to 200%. Huh. Is this good for poisonous concoction? I mean, poisonous concoction took a pretty, took a pretty big skill adjustment. But is this good for poisonous concoction? Oh, maybe it like takes, I don't know. Maybe it takes like a percentage and then modifies the percentage so it doesn't actually do that. Either way, the crucible passive skill that caused totems to explode on death, dealing a percentage of their life as physical damage has had its values divided by 20. This change affects existing items. Unlucky standard players. Yeah, that's really unlucky. That's almost unplayable even at like top tier builds. I mean, it's still good, right? The top tier builds still have what? 20 million, 30 million damage. Kind of sad. The Eternal Labyrinth now grants Ascendancy passive skill points in Ruthless. The existing Ruthless characters that complete the Eternal Labyrinth should automatically have these points available to allocate. They went back on Ruthless only having six points. <laughs> okay. Guardian. Is this all Ruthless stuff? Ruthless specific changes. I don't care about any of this. I'm sorry for any of you that like Ruthless. I'm not reading any of this. As you can see though, they have massively reworked the Ascendancies because they love Ruthless more than us. But all of the Ruthless Ascendancy changes have gone through apparently. Skill balance? Nope, that's ruthless. Nope. Nope. Monster balance? Stun immunity has been removed from many bosses in Path of Exile. This includes, but is not limited to, Aziri, Argus, the Vol, Omnitech, and Betrayal targets. Some bosses... Wait, Betrayal targets were stun immune before? <laughs> Some bosses now have specific 
Skills that cannot be stunned or cannot be interrupted. Katava is still unable to be stunned. Shaper Guardians, Elder Guardians, and Conquerors now drop far fewer influence items on death. Why? Slightly increase the outcome odds for Tainted Currency from beyond bosses and slightly reduce the odds outcome from other beyond monsters. Still a buff. Block your bosses. They suck. Monsters that are unable to be damaged, targeted, no longer regenerate life or energy shield. Or recharge energy shield. I like that. That's a huge buff. This was really annoying when you would fight like any of the Elder Guardians and you would phase them and maybe would be like, let me just top that off for you real quick. <laughs> There's a bunch of other like circumstances this place as well, but that's one that comes to my mind. I can finally do the thing, Ruthless. Yeah. <laughs> Katava skeletons in the Belfry boss arena now spawn as magic instead of rare. Nice. I'm so glad you took the Ruthless nerf and applied it to the main game. The temporal chain skill used by monsters now causes other effects on cursed enemies to expire 25% slower, previously 40%. Sure. Otherwise, we will just use, like, the Spectre. Fortune favors the Brave, cost 3, Chaos, yada yada, Essence is 2, Dom is 3, Breach is 4, Harb is 6. You get 3 Harbs. Legion is 6, Delirium is 10, Ritual is 10. Yeah, I could never see myself using the double cost fortune favors here. Doesn't seem worth it. They took the Lava Lake change and applied it to the map that was on the Atlas. Was that a lady in the main game and not just in Ruthless? I could have sworn that was in... I could have sworn they gave us rare still. The Catawba fights. Like, pretty sure... I could be wrong, obviously, but like, last time I read that they had nerfed the Katava monster spawning was because Ruthless players were using it to farm. They nerfed Katava like this league, and then swapped that for Belfry. I almost want to log into the game and run a Lava Lake, but I will just believe you, I guess. Devour support. These are all like quest rewards. You get your supports different places for the new supports. Item filter changes, bug fixes. Fix the bug where some breach monsters had 25% more life than they should have been when they were spectred. It was like the small stabby guys. Fix the bug where Gore the Grasping Maul was able to pull players to an invalid location. He could punch you across the map. It was really funny to watch. Fix the bug where mirror images of monsters can give souls to soldier monsters. That's a good thing to fix. That was really annoying. Fix the bug where taunted enemies were not receiving 10% less damage prior when dealing damage to a target other than that of the taunt. The one that taunted them. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. This seems terribly important. Changes since the original post was made. They now have a tapering, less damage, damage for 15 seconds. Sure. They now have a tapering, less damage taken buff which activates upon entering their range and eventually scales down. After 15 seconds. Oh, it was no damage taken. Gotcha. No damage reduction. It was just like a typo. I gotcha. Alright, cool. Dispatch. I don't know. It seems okay. I'll be honest. It seems boring. I'm not... I, I thought I was going to be excited about the keystones. I'm not... I'm not excited about the ascendancy changes. They seem terrible overall. Even if there are going to be like cool builds you can make out of it, they're not very exciting to me. A lot of the Atlas Pastels changes I'm not excited about. I'm I'm excited for the Vol changes. I think that's cool. I think having access to full Beyond in your maps is cool. Otherwise, I don't know. It's very boring. The auto battler. I think it's going to have the same problem for me that Sanctum had. Your character's eventually going to be strong, and then nothing matters. You just walk in, kill all the kill all the mobs, loot the thing. 
There's not gonna be like any engagement with the mechanic. You're just walking in and getting your loot. The new Sanctum stuff could be cool. They rework Sanctum. They didn't look like they reworked any of the uniques, so like Eternal Damnations and whatnot are still powerful. There's nothing really going on. I'll still play it over D4 Season 1 though. I mean, sure. I'll still... I'll play Baldur's Gate over this. <laughs> I might play this for like a little bit. I mean, I like Path of Exile a lot, but like... There's nothing in here where I'm like... Hell yeah. It's time. Especially if we, like, collapse this. I collapse the... The Ruthless stuff. And we see how much it is. Extremely underwhelming, yeah. What if they changed drop rates and didn't mention it? I mean, that's not gonna be relevant to me. I'm either gonna play too much S stuff, it's not gonna matter, or I'm gonna play trade if it does matter, right? If I'm playing trade, like the 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 amount something costs in trade is never relevant. Like I play the game too much, right? Just buy it. <laughs> I think Sanctum gives enough other rewards beyond it that it's not gonna matter. It's never gonna be too expensive, especially if I play like a damnation build in like softcore or something. Oh yeah, it's time for Bone Zone once again. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I want to play. Nothing is really exciting. Like, none of the new passive, or new supports makes me want to play anything. I will say this, I'm glad I played with Vengeance Cascade last league, because Scuff support Vengeance Cascade is much worse. I don't know. Okay, I actually am going to get up, get a water, stretch my legs, yada, yada, yada. Then we'll go back to Baldur's Gate. I appreciate y'all for being here. I hope y'all enjoyed the reading of the patch notes. I don't mean to be like so, such a downer on it. It's just like, I need, I need the mechanic to be fun. But that's pretty true of a lot of leagues for me. I need the mechanic to be fun for me to be engaged. There wasn't any like big reworks to the end game. There wasn't any big, you know, introduction of, like, Masters or something, right? So, like, this league is going to be the league or nothing. And I shouldn't say nothing. I mean, there's still just, like, you know, private leagues are fun, events are fun, all that other stuff, but... I don't know. It's pretty underwhelming. And then we have, like, Baldur's Gate. I want to do multiple runs of Baldur's Gate. I don't know if I will currently, but I want to do multiple runs of Baldur's Gate. We have Starfield coming out, we have Armored Core coming out, all kinds of stuff coming out. Do the Hardcore SSF race, not a chance. I hate doing those events a lot of the time. <laughs> They're like kind of fun, but I don't know. They're a little miserable too. You have a good night, Slacker. I really, really wanted to do them to boost melee, slams especially, but sadly nothing. What are you talking about? You can bleed with your slimes now. Enjoy. Get corrupting blood. Wow, hardcore. Hell yes. Hell yes. Bohan. Hell yes. I'm actually so excited to do that. That's like the 26, right? Plenty of time for more Baldur's Gate. Three days of PoE. More Baldur's Gate. Like, seriously? Yeah. I think it's fun. Wow, Horcore sounds so scuffed. Sure. It is going to be scuffed. It's part of the fun. I don't I don't expect to be like, you know, full on raiding or anything. I don't expect to be like pushing terribly deep, but the like 1 to 60 process I think is going to be fun. August 24th, I believe so, yeah. And I'm sure at some point I'll come back. If I do take a break from Poe, I'm not sure if I am going to take a break from Poe and play this other stuff. Like, maybe the league's amazing. Maybe I really enjoy the auto battle or maybe whatever happens. Maybe there's some fun leagues. Maybe I really want to prep for Gauntlet. Who knows? But I'm sure at some point I'll come back and 
brush up on my post skills to try to be at least present in Gauntlet. Either way, let me get a water. My throat is 